I'm at a gypsy. I, I still remember just, I felt like every time they brought a new fork or a new shock, I'm like, this thing just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The diameters were getting bigger, but you know, they tried everything. And uh, I would say going into 2000, even though I knew there were one or two spots, I felt like the KTM maybe didn't handle quite the best. And it was typically just rear acceleration from the middle to the exit of turns when they got really choppy. Besides that, that bike was incredible. It turned so good. Uh, the power was awesome. I got a lot of hole shots, which obviously makes life a lot easier. I didn't realize at the end of this, I, I don't know how or what, but we didn't really understand that going to America where they have a production rule, things were going to change because I had a full-fledged factory bike. Mm. You could have said, even though there were four or five factory KTM guys, I think our bikes were all different. We all had different frames, different swing arms. And that's the beauty of GPs. It's pretty much as long as it's got 125 cc's and a couple other rules, run what you brung. And KTM made the most of that. So, like I said, when I came to America and had to get on a production bike, it was a significant step backwards, in my opinion. Mm. And I didn't factor that in, you know, because in Europe, the Cowies were slow, were known as the slowest bikes, and they just didn't they didn't do that great, you know, in the, in the two years I was on KTM. So in my head, I'm coming to America going, KTM's the new brand. It's the brand to be on. And uh, there again, I hadn't had Supercross experience without a linkage, which I yeah, think also was a mistake because I I struggled a lot with confidence in the whoops. And, and you know, you start thinking it's me more than the bike until I went to Pro Circuit years later and I was just like, oh, this is beautiful. I've never felt so confident hitting whoops. So... Pros and cons with with both decisions and both uh, bikes um, at different times, but yeah, that, that that factory KTM, I really do believe, was just the outright best bike on the on the line at that time in the World Championship. Man, that's amazing to to know that the arc that you went through and for that to be like your first factory team, and then to get given that experience of building a motorcycle from the ground up, like did that. Did that experience in that one off season, I could see that carrying through your entire professional career. Like that would have, I could see that changing you as a motorcycle rider forever. Yeah. You know, you, you have to, um, you know, even with testing, you know, I think from a young age it was easy to go. Yeah, I like it. Or I don't like it. Now they're there with, you know, iPad. Well, I didn't even know they had iPads in, but they got little laptops and they've got notepads and all that, and they're just asking you like to really break it down. You know, well, why didn't you like it there? And what did it feel like there? Could if we did that, do you think that would make that better? And I, you know, it was like as a kid, you're just like, okay, let me let me try and use my words and explain it. But um, yeah, it was it was really interesting to be at that age and have all these resources coming at you. And like I said, KTM, I remember Kurt Nickel uh, was spearheading the whole factory operation. And I remember in an article, he said, I'm turning the world orange. Mm. And I remember thinking like, yeah, that's, that was a pretty powerful statement. And, and, and he put his balls on the line because if they were floundering at the back, he would have looked like an idiot as well. But there was just a group of people that were like, we're going to do whatever we can. And, I had to f build the bike around myself. They just gave me all these tools. That's why I said, it, when I'm like, oh, what's different with these frames? They're like, they're all different. I'm like, yeah, but what's different? They're like, don't worry, just ride it. Don't have a biased opinion. Just ride it, tell us what you like and why. Mm. And then we would go to another track two weeks later and do all the same thing again, but it'd be a completely different type of track. And then it was funny also to then hear some of my comments and I'm like, oh boy, I'm, I'm contradicting myself. I really mm. like that over there, but now I'm kind of dogging it over here. And, you know, then, you know, even like your dad will be like, so what changed? I'm like, uh, the track, you know, that worked there. It doesn't work there. But then that also helps us with things going, all right, if we go to this track, maybe we swing, switch to that swing arm or, you know, that setup. So um, it was cool because you don't get a whole lot of that nowadays. Mm. Um, you know, even in Europe, I think the Japanese, it's still production. Even though they could change, it's pretty much production. I know a few of those teams make some trick parts and change things, but it's for the most part, we've sort of gone back to that production. Mm. Even if it's not a rule, everyone's running 
basically production. Maybe if someone really dislikes something, they'll manufacture a swing arm or a shock body, but it's typically what they sell is what is what the guys are racing. Yeah, yeah. Both uh, in Europe and in America. Yeah. So one of the, like for, for me, right? So when I was a kid growing up, my dad always rode Hondas. And then, you know, that's what I had when I raced. And it was like, I, my first bike was a CR125. And then my second bike, I bought a CRF250. And then I got a CRF450. And it was like, I had one year where I went to Yamaha through like a, a shop sponsorship. And then I fucking hated it. Uh, sorry, a Cowie. Fucking hated it. I went back to Hondas. And then uh, it wasn't until the JDR, I got like a 350 like the first year when simmons rode it and i like had a bike i could go out and kind, uh -huh. of, kind of ride but in terms of like so my dad i liked hondas because of my dad and then dad liked hondas because of the, the cultural movement of the honda from the elsinore you know like a changed motocross oh, yeah. my dad was the same way yep so you, you have like yeah, he this. raced in Elsinore. So he's the same way. He was a Honda guy. And from a young age, my dad said to me, my dream is that you're a factory HRC rider. That was his dream for me. Yeah. I was like, I just want to win championships. <laughs> yeah. So that that uh, yeah, like that there's that era. Right. And it's like that that motorcycle was just that was the pinnacle. And it just created this like legacy that that still exists now, like the HRC kind of deal. But I look at in in my own life i've watched i feel like i've watched ktm do to the motocross bike what honda did with the elsinore and it's like as i've sure like the i've got two i've got a ktm 350 and a husky 125 in my garage and it's like i got a 96 cr 250 and i love that's i'll literally never sell that bike like i'll probably give that to my kid one day you know but so there is still that love from being a kid. But in terms of like what KTM did for me and like I watched that evolution happen and, you know, you watch the way, like I remember um, like your 125 uh, in the, the GPs and then when you raced the, the 250 two-stroke in America and then watching Ben Townley on that number, I think he was like number 30. And, you know, I'd see like on motocross yeah. action – motocross action and they had the, the wp forks and like a fucking factory ktm in that era when i was a kid was just like the gnarliest thing ever and you watched it kind of suck and then you see this evolution uh and then you know like dunge to do what dunge did for that brand to go and win a supercross title on, on that bike and then the 350 you had caroli winning world titles on this alternate size motor and now mm -hmm. that you know they there was like a dungy error and now they've done it with cooper webb and it's just like ktm has gone through this incredible transition and i, I think that they've done for the modern motocross bike what honda did for for the elsinore 100 percent. yeah i would i would agree with that uh you know one of the things my dad is into is uh old vintage bikes restoration yeah. all that and you know now that i'll have probably some extra weekends i'm sure i'll be uh racing a few of them he's building a a couple hl 500s and then probably a lot of people don't even know what those are they were old tt 500s and there was a european version the bent airberg version and in america ricky johnson actually raced one briefly oh, but wow. just they were punched out like 600 cc wicked things uh, and they basically took a street bike or a enduro bike took that motor and put it into a motocross setup in fact the guy that builds the kits is is in australia because my dad's been dealing with him so that'll be fun when it's done to to ride that but yeah kate ktm in that era of the 90s that i remember being around 90s into 2000 that you know just being in europe we went to the factory f quite frequently and just seeing what they did whether it was off-road dakar rally whatever i mean they just because I remember thinking at one point, man, these guys are really into off-road. But they had made a, a plan and a direction, and they went at it hard. And even I feel like there was that transition when I was there, and then there was a bit of a lull, and then I left. And I, I really feel like in Supercross and that, there was an inferior motorcycle. And then, like you said, another wave came along with a good group, and I think Roger DeCosta obviously had a lot to do with it 
he was able to make promises to Dunge to get him over, to get other people involved. Ian Harrison, who had been a long time his right-hand man at Suzuki, who was Elbertain's mechanic back in the day, was now coming over to KTM. There was guys that I worked with in the GPs that came over that were working. So then there was this next wave where they decided we need a linkage. We, you know, we're, we're, we're basically revamping this entire machine from the ground up. And since that happened, they've obviously had a lot of success. But the thing to think that that was really great out of that is it made the Japanese wake up mm -hmm. and then have them come to the party and step it up and maybe get a little out of the comfort zone. I know that they like to test things for many, many years before bringing it to production. I started seeing those those wait times go from five, six, seven years to two to three years, you know, because KTM was progressing at a faster rate than them. And I think a lot of times they were thinking, well, there'll be failures. And if you look at it, everyone's, every manufacturer's had a failure at some point. It's just, you'll never get around that. But the fact that they've also had so little failures by pushing the envelope, they just went pedal to the metal and focused on off-road and moto, you know, and, I, and it showed. And I think it comes back to why even now when we talked, we were talking earlier about how all the bikes are so similar because I know for a fact, because I won't even mention names, but I think everyone will put two and two together. Because of where I'm located, I have all the manufacturers coming into my shop buying the other manufacturers' bikes so they can take them back and dissect them and go through it all. So everyone knows exactly what everyone else has at the moment. And uh, they, they do it similar, but then they put their own little spin on it, whether it's you know the styling or the finishing touches or maybe what size forks they're going to run or clamp or whatever it may be. They're similar but you buy that bike, if you don't like it exactly how it is, you can make a few changes and it'll be how you want it. So throwing that all together, I think Honda did a phenomenal job back in the day. And I, and I think Honda, we could argue, fell asleep at the wheel. Mm -hmm. I, I think they rested on their laurels and then all of a sudden they went from being the bike to be on to, you got to look at a lot of the results after that, that era, kind of after Jeremy really even, you know, there was there was a lull for Honda. You know, even um, even they would bring the stats up in the Pro Motocross Series this year. The last time Yamaha won was me in 07 and then Ferrandis. And you think, wow, that's a long time for a big brand like Yamaha. And then you go, well, hang on a second. The last Honda win was Ricky in 04. We're coming up on almost 20 years now. And that's a brand that was used to winning and dominating. Mm. So... I'm sure even for them, they're going to be going, wait a minute, we're the best brand. We arguably have the best rider and, and the next and the next next best rider because you could say Chase Sexton's the future of Honda. They got Jet in the pipeline. Like mm. you would think they're doing everything right, but guess what? Still not many number one plates on the wall. So it's just a, it's a crazy industry sometimes. We're excited to announce the launch of our new membership site, gypsytales.com packed with exclusive content and perks that you won't find anywhere else. This is your chance to become a part of the Gypsy Gang. And as a special bonus, if you sign up to an annual membership, you'll be entered into the draw to win our custom-built TC125. Gypsy Gang.